Hi, so today we've got this uh, thing to look at. This is a uh, geodimeter, or commonly known as a total station. Not quite sure of the history of the naming. I'm, I imagine total stations may be a brand product name that's got incorporated as now a generic term for this type of device. Uh, this is used for surveying. So a buildings road, you quite often see sort of people by the side of the road using these at building sites. Essentially what it does, it's a way of mapping out positions of objects in sort of 2D and to some extent 3D space. So it's got basic means of very accurately measuring horizontal sort of vertical angle and also a um, laser rangefinder to measure distance. It's got a telescope so you can actually sight the, uh, the object you're trying to measure. Normally quite often there's sort of it's operated by two people. One guy's got a, a post with a reflector that this then targets to then measure the yeah, the, ang the angular position and distance to that object. And you sort of do that several times to uh, map, map out uh, an area. Now, this isn't quite what I expected when I saw, I saw this on eBay and sort of didn't look at it too hard. But from the description and the lack of any user interface, I thought this was actually going to be a remotely operated one. Now, I've seen these a couple of times, for, for example, if they're doing major building works, they sort of perma or semi permanently mount these so that they periodically check dimensions of you know, certain positions, say, around a building. I've seen one of these on the London Underground when they were doing building works above, and this would, you know, this thing would sort of periodically just sort of move, move and target various targets that were placed around the station. So obviously, it was measuring to see if there's any movement caused by the, uh, the building works. So I thought um, that this was that type of thing, but I think it's simply just a standard manual one, but without the um, user interface or computer panel that clicks in here. And so this is probably just going to be sort of the actual sensing and measuring, but I think what we ex would expect to see is some you know, very high precision angular measurement stuff and the um, laser rangefinder stuff. So I think it's still going to be uh, potentially quite interesting. Uh, this is a spectral precision constructor. Uh, there's quite a few brands of these things available. As far as I can tell, they all seem to do pretty much the same job. I'm actually quite surprised there are, there are sort of so many of uh, different ones of these and again I'm, I'm sure there are people that have used these that, that know sort of in more detail about the differences obviously there's going to be differences in precision um, and I'd imagine that the yeah, GPS is probably used quite a lot more these days than uh, when this thing uh, was produced. One thing that's rather puzzling I just don't understand why it would be there there's an ASCII code table on the front Again, someone that's familiar with these might explain why you might actually want an ASCII code table on a measuring instrument like this. I just can't think why, but clearly, you know, they've got the trouble of doing a nice high quality label with it on there. So I don't know whether that's because of some quirk on the way user interface and the way these things are usually used or, or what, I don't know. But it just seems a rather odd thing to uh, have on there. So externally, it's sort of fairly simple. This bottom part is the battery. This comes off and this indicator is just an indicator to tell you whether it's like full empty or partly charged. It also looks like this is used to help counterbalance this because if you take the battery off it then it obviously it flips over like that so they're actually using this to help um, balance this part so it's got a fairly neutral uh, balance. Um, there's various knobs, a couple of knobs at the side and the bottom, no idea what they do. We've got the sort of telescope, there's like a focus adjustment and this has got a very, see, yeah, seems to be a very long range telescope, you know, distance over distance like 100 meters you know the field of view is only sort of a few sort of tens of centimeters so it's a uh, quite a sort of long range zoom which you can you'd expect for a, um, a surveying type thing and the, the image quality is very good on this and there seems to be some sort of button on the front there there's another interesting thing is on the top and bottom you've got these little tubes and i was a bit puzzled to what they were but in fact they seem to be quite a clever optical device i'll see if i can set the camera up so you can actually see the effect what this is, this is an alignment aid, so the person um, at a distance holding the reflector can actually see if they're lined up with the, um, the lens. It's a little bit hard, it works better in person than on a camera. There's like an outer circle and then an inner sort of circular dot, which you, know, you, you see the dot when you're lined up exactly there with the lens. And this is actually visible at a surprising distance. Obviously, you'd probably use binocular or a telescope to actually sight it from a distance, but it means that yeah, the person at the other end can get get themselves lined up. Uh, it's not much in the way of I/O on this. I'm sure modern ones have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all sorts of other stuff. But this has just got a four-pin connector here, which is, I'd imagine, RS two three two, maybe also power, and that's sort of pretty much it. And so there's this connector on here. There's a, obviously a thing that clicks on the front, which is your user interface, um, and sort of built computer that does all the various calculations based on all the angles to convert those to distances and so on, and then probably some, you know, logging. So taking this front panel off, nothing at all exciting, just an interconnect board to the user interface and a couple of ribbon cables. 
And the panel on this side is equally unexciting. We've got ribbon cable just going down to an interconnect PCB that goes to this push button on the front. This is like a rubber membrane switch. And obviously there's a lot more cores here. I'm sure there's different variations of these that maybe have different wood trails on here, hence the uh, larger number of cores in this uh, ribbon cable. The only other thing is this mechanical adjustment where turning this pushes, the, there's a sort of truth and it's pushing this uh, actuator backwards and forwards. So that's clearly yeah, making some sort of mechanical adjustment to uh, whatever's uh, inside here. So taking this side panel, we've actually found some electronics in here. Um, there's cabling, so there's a cable to the front panel user interface and various other stuff in the sort of the bottom section. Fairly packed board, looks like there's a lot of power stuff. There's a couple of inductors here, quite a lot of capacitors. So this is a lot, this is probably power control. Quite a big space here. Although there don't seem to be any sort of mounting bosses for like extra electronics or anything to go here. So you've got this pretty jam-packed board here and lots of empty space and it doesn't even look like they intended to have that as an option for anything. This top board is connected directly to something that goes through to the rotating sensor part and the board underneath it, interesting, it's got a whole load of these um, film capacitors. These are actually sort of through hole caps where the leads have been bent round and sort of formed onto these metal plates to make them service mountable. These are all one microfarad 63 volts and they're connected to a whole load of analog switches so I'd imagine that's maybe some sort of sampling type thing going on and we've also got the processor, it's uh, an 80 c 32 processor, software and external EEPROM, some RAM, just some uh, buffer chips, so that's just a fairly uh, simple sort of uh, embedded processor, 1997 date code on there. And down here we've got a connector onto this assembly, I'm sure this is going to be the um, some sort of encoder for the uh, the tilt access, sort of big round thing there with a the ribbon connect cable connector on here. I've read this EEPROM, there's no text or anything uh, obvious in there, it's pretty full though, there's about 30 odd K of code in there. So there's uh, quite a lot of stuff going on, clearly. Imagine that the uh, the actual user interface stuff is probably going to be handled with it by a separate processor that lives in this unit. So I think this is probably literally just doing all the mechanics of um, driving the hardware. Okay, I've got this encoder off now. This little wire here actually goes to the centre of the encoder. So the, yeah, this sensor part is coupled to the uh, the rotating part. And this is static, so this this sensor bit rotates relative to the uh, the outer piece, so it's, uh, this is unexpected. I was fully expecting this to be some sort of optical encoder with some sort of yeah, very fine gratings, but it's not, it's inductive. We've got this center piece, which is fed by this this wire. This will clearly obviously explain the transformer. So there'll be like an AC signal being fed into here, and this has got the same patterning on both sides. And then there's coils on both sides which are obviously looking at the um, the phase shift as the thing rotates, um, like a, an LVDT type transducer. There's also um, five opto-reflective sensors around here, which are obviously reflecting off of here to produce like to get um, no doubt an absolute position. So as this, this rotates, you know, it knows exactly which of these it's seeing the reflection on. So it's got a some sort of absolute position reference. Then from then it can um, use this the inductive to get, no doubt, a, yeah, a much higher precision output. Obviously it's hard to tell what the actual resolution of this, because obviously that's going to be um, analog. Um, I can't find any spec for this, but looking at the spec for a modern device, they're talking a sort of around a sort of one second, so one three thousand six hundredth of a degree, and over like a, a 90 degree range, you're looking at something of the order of sort of few ppm sort of resolution. Obviously this may, may not be quite that much, but obviously it is, yeah, if you're doing sort of surveying, you, you do need quite good resolution to get angles over the uh, distance. These coils are a sort of multi-layer board with the coils on the inner layers, obviously to protect them from any um, abrasion. There's just a few interconnects on the uh, outer layers. This inner one seems to be glued down, so I can't easily get that out. And I'm sure we've got the exact same type of encoder here for the uh, the rotation measurement. There's a couple of, sort of serial number stickers on the bottom marked sort of uh, H and V and the V1 corresponds with the uh, the number that's on this encoder here doing the uh, the vertical up down. Okay around the other side we have another PCB inside the cover with a couple of um, backup batteries on there and some mechanical stuff. Now for each of the two axes we've got sort of two knobs. There's this one which is sort of pushing this in this direction and there's also one on the side that operates this which I can't immediately see, I'll have to have a close look to see what that's adjusting but 
there's a cable assembly here that runs through to the center to the uh, rotating part and at the bottom there's a sounder which looks like it's a hearing aid type sounder which is a bit uh, interesting never seen that before on this board we've actually got a, a whole load more stuff there's a 87c51 sort of single chip micro here a bit of ram uart chip uh, rs232 drivers whole bunch of analog switching here a few other bits of power supply stuff a couple of batteries which are probably backing up this ram so i wonder if maybe this is the user interface sort of front panel processor it's an inductor on the back here i think that's probably connected with the power supply right, i think i figured out these knobs this is basically a sort of coarse fine type thing so to get the sort of coarse adjustment this sort of moves freely but if you then tighten this down on the side knob this then basically locks it and then you can do a fine adjustment using this uh, knob on the side here so that just gives that fine adjustment through this pin so yeah that makes sense because the mechanisms are basically the same on both axes so it's just a, a sort of a, a way of providing a sort of course fine adjust but being able to like swing it easily without having to use the fine adjustment to move it over a large distance and this is the same thing on the uh, rotation axis we've got this this is the uh, the lock knob here do you see this actually there's a set of three brass inserts here so when it tightens this up it locks this ring onto this center piece and then sort of allows the, the adjustment where, and then when this gets undone that can now move freely and this bottom assembly we've got the same type of encoder that we saw on the vertical axis again we've got the uh, center center connection for the uh, to generate the field for that um, <clears throat> central rotor and then there's these other connections which i'm sure will go down to this connector this is probably a, a slip ring type arrangement for that uh, connector i suspected this was probably rs232 and power and it looks like it's, we've got a fuse here so that'll be for the power connection and interesting the uh, the outline for that is actually uh, a d nine way d connector what says so probably different versions maybe the, the less outdoor proof a less outdoor proof version that uses a D connector here and this just plugs into a uh, board that's uh, down here which is pretty part of the um, slip ring assembly and in the bottom we've got the slip ring assembly so there's a massive great uh, bearing there's also a load of um, ball bearings here to carry the vertical load then we've got this PCB with some very heavy plated copper for the slip rings and on the bottom we've got these uh, Sort of spring-loaded contacts so i think they're pretty duplicating the tracks but they also seem to be duplicating the uh number of uh contact things for each of the tracks and there's two connection points on it on, on here so there's uh, quite a lot of redundancy on there to avoid any noise as the thing gets uh, rotated uh, inside the bottom there's one more module i suspect this is going to be a level sensor so the thing knows you, know, you can set this thing so it's exactly uh level to get an absolute vertical reference here a, here a slight movement so i suspect there's going to be some sort of ball or something uh it's got a few analog switches and op amps here uh this shielded can with a shielded cable going down to the center and this pcb some plugs there's another little pcb inside so uh, there's clearly something going on in this uh, central bit here so what's in here this seems to be a, a sort of an assembly on um some sort of uh like suspension here which can move very Sort of very very slightly highly constrained in two directions so obviously it's when it's level it's sort of sitting floating but it, anything slightly off level it's it just hits one of the end stops and then here we've got this electrode pattern so it, it, it's the way i'd imagine just looking at where the shielding is i'd imagine this section emits a signal or a sequence of signals that then couples into this top electrode this plate here and by looking at the relative strength of the signals you can figure out if it's level or tilted to one side or the other nothing super interesting under this can this is clearly just a very high impedance uh, input stage you can see a guard ring around that input from that uh, center it's just a tl072 op amp so it's a fet input op amp so it's just a sort of high impedance um, amplifier circuit picking up the um, signal from that capacitive sensor all right let's have a look at this central part now which is the battery charge port on those horrible uh, mini zinc connectors 1999 nickel metal hydride badgings interestingly there's sort of there's a 
sort of logo on the front of the battery and a hole there for it to show through. So perhaps a way of just being able to offer it in different brandings or something, I don't know. But so there's three contacts there, which would be obviously um, power and probably a temperature sensor. And behind the battery compartment, there's just a little board, a couple of um, transient suppressors, probably for anti-static on the battery connectors, and this LED that shines into the telescope assembly. So that's presumably to be some sort of visual indication when the user's um, looking through the uh, lens. Coming up the top, we are into the some optical goodness here. Another PCB here, and there's a couple of optical fibres that go into sort of this block down here. On the top there's this little motor with a disc. Now this seems to be um, like an optical attenuator. It'll clear at one end and gets sort of progressively darker. But also at the other end there's this section which is uh, a pair of mirrors so it can actually fire the light sort of straight back. So this is like an attenuator, it clearly goes through into probably the telescope assembly or it can be locally locally echoed back presumably for some sort of reference and calibration uh, purpose and there's what i'm guessing is probably a laser diode here feeding into one of those fibers and the other fiber goes into this uh, aluminium block which is probably the uh, receive amplifier and it looks like there's a sort of separator down the middle here to separate the transmit and receive path, there's sort of a matte black coated, there's like a wall on each side and you can also see that inside here, you can actually sort of see this dividing, uh, divided down the centre of the lens. So that's obviously separating the receive and transmit paths. Actually taking this bit out, um, there's clearly, we've got this, so the two fibres sort of fire in this direction. Now we've got what's clearly a filter, so that'll be a very narrow band filter, just so it looks at the um, laser wavelength. Okay, so just taking this part out, the uh, the two fibres sort of fire down here, you just see them coming in, there's probably a lens in there somewhere. These then hit this, which I'm, um, you can see sort of the black finish, I'm sure that'll be a, a narrow band optical filter to make sure only the infrared is uh, past and I think this is a mirror because if you look at the back I mean that's clearly not an optical surface at the back there so I think they're coming in sort of hitting the mirror that's then bouncing it back towards the you know the eye end of the telescope that's then being reflected back out the front lens. Right here at the uh, eyepiece end we've got this interesting little assembly what this, this is basically an inverting mirror to compensate from the, for the inversion of the optical system if we can demonstrate that so this basically just turns up, turns everything upside down. See, there's the fluorescent light on the ceiling there. So just by doing sort of multiple reflections, it goes sort of across, down, across, up, and then back through. So it just inverts the image. So taking apart the optics from the eyepiece end, so this is basically the eyepiece. We've got um, a lens here providing the mechanical zoom. There's a, uh, a ring with a sort of um, a helical guide in there so as you turn this it slides that lens in and out. And if you look at the front we can see how the infrared you know, this uh, rangefinder optics work now. So we've got this angled um, reflector so we've got the uh, uh, we've got the you know, where the fibre optics reflect off of this piece at the front. They sort of come up and then out the front and this looks like it's got a, a coating so that's going to be an infrared reflective coating to make sure well firstly that the um, maximum amount of infrared goes out the front but also to, to reduce the risk of any infrared laser going uh, towards the user's eyeball and there's also a little um, insert here which is that green lead that we saw from the battery compartment that sort of shines through so we've got like a little indicator so that when you're looking through it you can actually see a lead indication maybe that's to tell it when it when the rangefinder's got a got a target so looking at this pcb in here so we've got the two fiber optics uh, we've got the transmit laser i'm guessing it's probably a laser rather than a lead here this actually seems to be driven by a 74 ac 540 which are all eight gates connected in parallel so they're just using it as a high speed driver in fact, there's two NAT semi ICs with numbers I can't find. Each one, there's also an oscillator next to each one. There's a this little module with a trimmer, which I'm guessing is a temperature compensated oscillator, which is at 14.9985513 megahertz. And there's a crystal down here, which is 14.98704. So very close. 
I don't know a huge amount about the laser range finding, but I know they tend to um, use sort of fairly high frequencies, so they can do yeah, average over a very large number of cycles to get an accurate result. Um, I'm wondering if maybe, yeah, I can't really think why you'd have the same chip in a, what I'm guessing is sort of transmitted to the receive path, the receive module is sort of behind here. I wonder if perhaps this is a custom chip, and they made one custom chip that has both the receiver and the transmitter on it, and just use what you're one in each position. Um, so obviously a lot of the cost of doing custom chips is all the one-off cost and masking and so on. So if you need two different chips, I wonder if it's actually worthwhile to do it by just making one chip with both functions and then just pick which function you use depending on um, sort of pin strapping or something. Uh, there's another process of this, just a, uh, a single chip micro 8051 based uh, architecture, fairly old. It's about 1996-1997 sort of date codes on this, so it's sort of fairly old. Okay, this is what's inside that can. This is obviously the optical receiver, which is going to be um, sort of highly sensitive, very high frequency. There's um, any 602 mixer oscillator here, so I think the architecture of this is probably going to be not unlike a sort of radio receiver. One thing is interesting, you've got this sort of coil here and what looked like a couple of um, high, high voltage diodes. I wonder if maybe this is using something like a, an avalanche photodiode, which uses you know, moderately high voltages and not high tens to low hundreds of volts for sort of super high sensitivity. And there's a bit of other analog stuff going on here. But it's interesting they chose to sort of put the uh, optics down a fibre rather than locate the uh, sensor you know, right in the optical system, which is sort of more, more common. There's a certain amount of loss through the fibres, obviously the, the fact they can um, stick the whole thing in the can. Maybe that, that gives better performance than trying to um, shoehorn some of this electronics into a compact optical assembly. And the bottom of the die looks just slightly unusual, just the way it, the pins come out offset like that. So I wonder if that may be something uh, a little bit exotic. So I've tried powering this up, just sticking 12 volts down the external connector. Um, not a great deal happens. You press the button, you see this little wheel zero out, a couple of beeps. And I'm getting just like a greater than prompt out the serial report. I've tried throwing some commands at it, but I just get just say, keep saying uh, 21, which I'm guessing is a, an error code. So um, I can't find any info on RS232 commands. Now I don't know whether it's even possible to use this without the control panel down RS232 or not. But um, I've sort of left it in one piece just in case it might be of uh, use to someone. But so without that control panel, I don't think it's uh, particularly useful. So that's fairly interesting. Um, I've seen one or two other teardowns of similar devices. There's, if you just search uh, Total Station teardown on YouTube, there's a few, uh, quite a lot by uh, one excellent um, French channel where they tear down all sorts of weird military stuff. At least one of those did use an optical encoder. I was quite surprised to find an inductive encoder in this. Um, it's possible maybe there's some patents that mean that you know, different manufacturers have to use different me methods because of their competition have um, painted them. Now, these things are sort of crazy expensive, new, sort of well into the you know four to five figures. And obviously newer ones will do will have stuff like you know motorized axes and GPS and all sorts of other. Uh, bells and whistles on them. And obviously they're built very rugged, you know, this is a solid sort of aluminium casting. Obviously it's designed for use around sort of building sites, so it uh, needs to be fairly uh, robust. So I have no idea whether, you know, to what extent this actually works, so the, the RS-232 did produce something, um, but obviously without that front panel it isn't uh, all that uh, useful, so it, there might be some way to operate it entirely through RS-232, but uh, I don't really know.